when dealing with the book of Revelation, something of great interest to people is who are the two witnesses of Revelation chapter 11. Now, if you're watching this video thinking that I'm going to tell you who they are, I would never do such a thing because the Bible does not reveal who they are. The Bible tells us who they are like, but it does not tell us who they are, their identity. It only tells us that they are faithful servants of God. They prophesy, they bear witness, and there's something that may be very surprising. So to encounter that, take out your Bible and look with me to that location, the book of Revelation and chapter 11. Now, we know something. We know that the city of Jerusalem is going to be trampled by the nations, and we're speaking about the nations that are led by the Antichrist. And they're going to be trampled for those 42 months. That equals three and a half years, or 1,260 days. And then we find that something's going to change. And that is God's wrath is going to begin to fall. It's in the second half of Daniel's 70th week that the wrath of God begins to fall upon the world. And I would suggest to you that the ministry, the work, the prophecy of these two witnesses are going to be during the time of God's wrath. And what we're going to find is that these two witnesses are faithful, but nevertheless, they are hated by the world. And this reveals something to us. And that is, by and large, the world does not like prophecy. And it's so disappointing today that one of the least likely places that, that sermons come from today is from the prophets. This is a great error. We should be focusing on the prophets because the prophets' revelation tells us how to be found faithful in the last days. Well, let's begin. Revelation chapter 11, and we're going to begin in verse 3. Now, it literally says, and I will give my two witnesses. Now, this shows a Hebraic character. Because in Hebrew, we can use the word noten to give in the sense of setting or placing. So we might better understand it this way. I will set my two witnesses, set them in place. I will give them to this ministry. And he says, and they will prophesy 1,260 days. And they're clothed in sackcloth. Now, I would suggest to you that this sackcloth speaks about repentance, that they are call, calling the world to repent, but the world's not going to want to repent. And when we look during the time of the, the trumpet judgments and the bowl judgments, God is calling the people to repent, but they did not. They would not turn from their wickedness. They were committed not to truth, not to righteousness, but to their own idolatrous, evil, wicked behavior. And that's why these prophets that were faithful to God are going to be rejected by the world. So once again, we see that they prophesy in sackcloth 1,000 260 days, verse 4. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands. Now, what this is telling us, and this is a reference to a prophecy from the book of Zechariah, and it's simply to tell the reader, these are anointed by God. And they manifest, their prophecy manifests illumination. They give light, truth to the nations, the world. But once again, despite being anointed by God, despite being instruments of revelation and illumination of the truth of God, 
we're going to find that they are rejected. And we see here something very important. It says, these are the two olive trees and the two lampstands. They are before the God of the earth standing. Now, that shows their anointing that they have been appointed by God for this purpose of prophesying. And once more, they're going to be rejected. Look at verse 5. And if anyone then desires to act unjustly. Now, we can understand this to harm, to, to deal with unkindly. But it's literally the concept of dealing unjustly, unrighteously, meaning against God's will. So once more, if anyone should, should them desire to behave unjustly, fire will come forth from their mouths and consume, devour their enemies. And if anyone desires once more to be unjust, unrighteous, unto them in this manner it's necessary for him that is that one that's that's unkind unjust it's necessary for him to to be put to death verse six these have authority now we're not speaking about one or the other we're speaking about both of them these have authority to close up the heavens in order that it should not fall rain in their days of prophecy. So when they're prophesying those days, no rain is going to fall. Now, we've already learned they are calling the people to repentance. The people of the world they are in a rebellious, in an ungodly, in a disobedient condition. And therefore, because of that, when the scripture talks about rain not falling, it's saying God's not blessing. They are not in the spiritual condition, the world, for God to bless them. They are behaving unjustly, unrighteously. As we know, they are deeply involved in sin. So God is not blessing. These, both of them, are going to close up the heavens. They have that authority. Now, who comes into our mind is Elijah. Elijah prophesied when Israel was in great spiritual sinfulness, great disobedience, great spiritual corruption. And he called the people to repent. And during his days, it did not rain. He closed up the heavens of course god commanded him to do so and it also tells us not only that it won't be rain during those those days of their prophecy but it says and they have authority over the waters to turn these waters into blood now this is important because this calls our attention to moses now, Moses signifies a change. We see that Moses not only had the power to turn water into blood, but notice something else, and to strike the earth with every plague as often as they should desire. So these two witnesses, they close up the heavens like Elijah, and they also have the power to turn water into blood and also to strike the earth as often as they want with plagues. Remember, during Moses' work, there was those 10 plagues that strike Egypt. And here's what's so important. All of this was preparation for Israel's redemption. And this is what this is foreshadowing in the same way that Elijah, this prophet of God, he was called to bring about a change among the people and he did so by saying you're not able to be blessed by god in this spiritual condition why because they were in idolatry they were serving self and following idols rather than serving god and following truth so moses he foreshadows a coming redemption and this is what the people of god should also expect in the last days 
So they have the authority to strike the earth with every plague as often as they desire. Verse 7. And whenever they should complete their testimony, what's going to happen? Only when they finish, we learn something. Then it says a beast. And this is that evil empire, the Antichrist empire. That beast that comes up from the abyss, he will do something. He is going to make war with them. And here's what's surprising. And overcome, have victory over them. Now, this is important because, see, in, in most stories, we want the good guys to be victorious, to defeat the enemy. This is not going to happen in this world. Rather, the good guys are going to be defeated. They're going to be overcome. They're not going to experience victory in the short term. They're going to be in battle and lose the battle. So it says here, not only are they going to be overcome, but it says also that, that this beast, this empire, is going to put them to death. Verse 8. And their bodies upon the street of that great city. What city? Which is called spiritually Sodom and Egypt. Now we would think Sodom and Gomorrah, but Sodom and Egypt. Now, Sodom speaks about great sin, that which is an abomination, and Egypt speaks of the world. Now, even though he calls this great city by the term Sodom in Egypt, we know we're speaking about Jerusalem. Why? It says, where also our Lord was crucified. He was crucified in Jerusalem. So it speaks about the dreadful, the sinful, condition of the holy city of Jerusalem. But nevertheless, in the same way that Israel, according to Jewish writings, Israel and Egypt had fallen spiritually into great moral corruption, spiritual wickedness, far removed from God, almost at the point of being reprobate. But then at the last moment, God redeemed them. And this is what God's going to do for the children of Israel in the last days. Primarily, this is not to believers. When these two witnesses are speaking, the rapture has already happened. I have shared with you that God's wrath is being poured out in the midst of their, their testimony. How do we know that? Because there's no blessing. It's not raining. We find that there's plagues that are happening through these two witnesses. So it says, and their bodies upon the streets of the great city, which is called spiritually Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Verse 9. And the ones from the people, from the tribes, and from the languages and the nations. They will see their bodies for three and a half days. Now, I would suggest to you that those three and a half days are, are symbolic, reminiscent to three and a half years. When the body of believers are going to be persecuted, that that Antichrist empire is going to make war with them and as it says in Revelation chapter 13, speaking about this beast that comes up from the sea, making war with the saints and overcoming us. This is what it says. So it's similar. What is the purpose for this? I believe it's to teach Israel what they saw concerning believers, the congregation of redeemed the church, being persecuted, being put to death. But we know something. There at the end of that time, when God says enough, there's going to be that blessed hope, that rapture. And we're going to see what happens to the two witnesses is very similar to what had taken place with the body of believers. Look again at verse 9. And 
the ones from the people, the tribes, the na languages, and the nations. They will see their dead bodies, their bodies, three and a half days. And their bodies will not be allowed to be buried in a tomb. What is that? Being forbidden a burial is an act of treating someone with great shame. So the world is going to have shame and contempt for these men of God, these faithful prophets, these witnesses, these two witnesses that God is going to anoint and send into this world. Instead of listening to truth, the world's going to reject the truth. The world's going to have contempt and shame for that which is true to God. Verse 10. Now, in verse 10, we encounter something that we do frequently, and that is, it speaks about those who dwell upon the earth. Frequently in the book of Revelation, it speaks about those who dwell upon the earth and those who dwell upon the heaven. It has nothing to do with where they are, are physically located. It has to do with their, their commitment, their citizenship, whether they belong to the world or whether they belong to the kingdom. And so those who belong to the world, those who have no covenantal relationship with God, it says these are the ones who dwell upon the earth. Look at verse 10. And the ones who dwell upon the, the earth, they will rejoice over them. And they will make merry. And they will send gifts to one another. Now, this is the opposite of what we should see. They should mourn for the death of these two faithful men, these godly witnesses, these prophets. But what did they do? Well, what does sending gifts to one another make you think of? That's right. Poram. What's written in the book of Esther? See, in the book of Esther, because of the victory of God's people, they sent gifts to one another. Here's the opposite. It's because of the presumed defeat of these two witnesses, God's witnesses, his, his prophets. They are sending gifts to one another. The exact wrong thing to do, according to one who understands biblical truth. So they are going to, to send gifts to one another, being happy, making merry, and the like. Look now to the end of verse 10. Because these two prophets, what were they doing? Speaking truth. But how did the world think of it? These two prophets, they tortured who? The ones who dwelt upon the earth. Just revealing to us, those who belong to the world is going to hate prophecy. Verse 11. And after these three and a half days, what's going to happen? The spirit, the living spirit from God will enter into them and they will stand upon their feet. And when that happens, that is the spirit of life is coming back into them. They are going to stand. And at that time, it says great fear will fall upon those who see them. Verse 12. And they heard a great voice from the heaven saying to them, come up here. So they heard and they witnessed a voice from heaven speaking to these two witnesses that were killed, that were shamed, were denied burial, that laid in the streets of Jerusalem for three and a half days in shame. But after that period of time, it says the spirit of the living God entered into them and they were stood upon their feet. And then they heard the voice from heaven saying, come up here. And they went up into the heavens in a cloud and their enemies saw them. And in that hour, there came about a great earthquake. Now, biblically speaking, an earthquake is a pur purpose. Every earthquake in the Bible says this has worldwide relevance. It's for everyone. 
what took place was not just for some people but for all people they witness a resurrection now this is important because whenever the term resurrection is mentioned or hinted to what should come into our mind the kingdom i've taught that many many different times in our various studies so they were overcome in the natural in their bodies so what don't put an emphasis on your body on your life emphasize obedience doing the objectives the purposes of god if you die so what if you're hated so what if the world has shame and contempt for you so what in the end god is going to speak to you and his spirit the very spirit of life will come into you he will stand you up and he will call you into the heavens this is what it's saying and all the enemies they are going to witness this look again middle of verse 12 and the enemies they will see them and at that hour there was that great earthquake and a tenth of the city fell a emphasis of judgment so we see judgment as they were coming up at that very hour they were going up there was a a, a relevance a, a a hint of god's judgment and then we see look now to verse 13 the second part it says and they were killed in that earthquake the names of men meaning the identity of seven thousand men and the rest of the ones they were fearful they became afraid and they gave glory to god of heaven now i would share with you that those who saw this that gave glory to god are from the children of israel this primarily even though the two witnesses spoke to all but where were they speaking from we don't have to guess it tells us jerusalem they were the prophets of the god of israel and they were speaking primarily to israel these are the ones who witnessed that and they gave glory to god they were changed by prophecy and this is the last thing i want to close with and that is it's prophecy that can bring great change into your life study prophecy it is not by chance that god used two witnesses who were his two prophets it's not important their identity if god wanted us to know he would reveal it to us but what it tells us is that his people were in a spiritually corrupt way they resembled the world rather than the truth of god but through prophetic revelation there is going to be a change to the true people of god they're going to hear prophecy and they're going to repent they're going to give glory to god that's what these two witnesses bring about for the children of israel well i'll close with that until next time shalom from israel